Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley. This is another follow-up to a Collab Talk Tweet Jam where we talk today about the state of Microsoft Teams. And I'll let you gentlemen introduce yourselves. Mark? Yeah, I'm Mark Vale. I'm the founder of Commsverse, sponsoring this Collab Talk. It's awesome. Um, I'm also a Microsoft Teams consultant, similar to, to Tom, who's going to come up next. Um, out of the UK, I've been doing Skype and Teams implementations now in the voice space for, well, donkey's years. Too long. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and Tom Abathnot, uh, Principal Solutions Architect at Modality Systems, and, and like Mark says, focused solely on Microsoft Teams and been through the whole OCS link, Skype, and, and now Teams thing. So I've been in the space quite a while. And uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, so as Mark mentioned, uh, he is uh, sponsoring the uh, sponsor today's Tweet Jam and the sponsor comms verse of this event that's coming up uh, next week. I know that there's activities that are happening this week as well, and we'll push this video out live uh, this evening so people still have plenty of time to go and register and sign up. But uh, yeah, so Mark, why don't you give like uh, 20 seconds to uh, the event? 20 seconds? There's a lot going on for 20 seconds. So we're a dedicated Microsoft Teams conference, so our sole focus is on Teams and how that can transform and enable businesses and users. Uh, we're a community conference, so we merged you know, MVP speakers and also industry speakers together into one sort of community effort. Um, we're online uh, next week, 6th of July to the to the 9th, 24 hours a day. Um, 169 speakers, 230 odd sessions, a whole bunch of activities going on, even VR if you're into VR, we've got VR exhibition hall. Um, it should be a great event. We've got Jeff Teeper, CVP from Microsoft, uh, doing some keynotes. Um, lots of Microsoft product group participation and support. So um, it's a place to go if you want to know and learn about Teams. Yeah, it's going to be a great event. It's free. I'll provide the links and stuff at the blog post and in the uh, and down in the description of the video as well. Well, let's jump in. So we just had this very active uh, uh, Collab Talk Tweet Jam. And uh, as always, so the folks that aren't familiar with it, so these have been running since January of 2012, almost every single month. I think I've missed three, maybe four months out of all those years. Uh, and they are community driven out on Twitter. So anybody can go and participate. Uh, our panel, we had something like 40 people on the panel actively participating. Who knows how many others were just lurking, watching. A lot of Microsoft people tend to just sit on the sidelines and occasionally comment, but just kind of listen. So it's a great uh, uh, you know, sounding board for feedback from the community. But we, I structure these things, seven questions seems to be the magic number, but you guys have to agree, it, these things fly by so fast. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it, it's cr crazy. Yeah, yeah. And you, you, want to, you want to read all the answers while you're getting ready to answer your next question. It's just like a absolute fire hose following the hashtag of like, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I agree, I disagree. Uh, I love it. And I love how open it is. You end up spinning off threads off of each question, and that's really great. But I keep telling people that said, oh, I missed it. And it's like, go in. It's Twitter. Yeah. It, 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 like, you can go and search on Tweet Jam responses from six years ago. It's all still out there and accessible. Um, so anyway, let's. we're going to walk through the questions, and we're going to kind of share our thoughts about these things. And we're, it's not going to take an hour, but we're going to go through these. Hey, so we kick. We've yeah. got Tom Arbuff not on here. It can take an hour. Yeah. That's, <laughs> they might, we're going to try not years. to take an hour. <laughs> so, so the first question was, has Microsoft Teams become the hub for collaboration within your organization? And if so, how? Do you want to take that one, Tom, first? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so we're obviously massively biased because we're 150 people around the world, mainly focused on Microsoft Teams. So not unsurprisingly, it's become core to our workflow. Um, but the how, I guess, is a bit more interesting. So every customer has a dedicated team. So right from the pre-sale stage, the first thing we do is create a team. Proposals go in there. Pre-sales conversations go in there. If the proposal converts to a project, it goes through our project management back office, gets a bit of a more, tends to get a bit of a more formal structure. Like there's a channel with the PO number for the project. There's a set set of tabs around dynamics and some other bits and pieces we use internally. Files live there, conversation lives there. Um, uh, it's, it's 
the only kind of thing where things go outside of the team is often customers where we still have old school engagement through email or something else. Like we do do guest access, um, but not every customer is 100% engaged in that process. And we'll talk about that later. Um, but as far as files and data and conversations from pre-sales to delivery to managed service, that's that's the world for that customer. Yeah, I mean, I echo that. I mean, I'm slightly different to Tom. Tom works for Modality. I kind of work for myself. So I go from project to project. So I see a lot of different things um so i don't really have i have a team of one and then i join somebody else's team and, and augment that a bit lonely yeah, eh? is it a bit lonely it is a bit lonely sometimes i end up sending emails to myself <laughs> <laughs> right, so a similar scenario though it's it's uh you know while i bring people in i've got part-time employees depending on the project a research effort or whatever that's going on but similarly i'm you know across dozens of different you know guest tenants mm -hmm. um and uh, I think in the responses, there are a lot of people that responded, uh, you know, that, that, that indicated that Microsoft was not the only stack that they were leveraging. There are other tools that exist that are out there. People have probably heard of some of those. You know, we don't have to familiar. mention them. We don't have <laughs> to talk about them. No, but, uh, it, it's, but it's interesting. And I think, but that's an important, you know, dialogue to, to have is that, that, I don't think it's true any longer. It's been, hasn't been true for a long time. There is no company that is like, we are 100% Microsoft stack. That's all that we do. Uh, I think if a CIO were to say that, there'd be snickering, laughing from the, you know, down below, because there's all these third party tools that are out there and that exist as part yeah. of the culture of the organization. Yeah, that's true everywhere. You know, we, we see it, we've seen it for years. Um, you could go back to Skype for Business Link OCS, and you wouldn't see a customer unless they're only very small, like single site. They would have dispersed telephony, for instance. They'd have dispersed email clients. They, that's not gone away. And the advantage of the cloud making it so easy just to sign up for a free trial and okay, now my department's trialed it. Now this app has become line of business. I need it. I'll swipe my credit card or whatever. Then that becomes. You know that becomes part of the organization and um, it's hard to control that especially with with you know how accessible the cloud is um and even with i had a, a similar discussion um with a company about their views on well everybody's going to go to team's voice and that's not the case you know there's going to be pbx's there's going to be analog there's going to be all kinds of telephony out there that we need to integrate with. And that's the same for collaboration as well. You know, there, there are people using Slack. You know, let's not, not beat around the bush. You know, acquisitions, you've got to merge those together. You a know. lot of community yeah. stuff that's happening out in Slack. And, you know, yeah. and, and and so that's why we actually had, right at the beginning of the Tweet Jam, somebody from uh, Mio. So I did, I used Leverage Mio to actually integrate conversations happening over in Slack. Mm -hmm with yep. the Microsoft team and community team. I thought that's fantastic. Uh, you'll be able to, there are solutions to go in and do that, to consolidate. Yeah, so I mean, if you look at, if you look at a product that a, a department's using and it works for them, and you're gonna go in there as an IT organization and replace that with something else that they gotta learn from scratch, and then turn around and say, right, okay, we've got to migrate all that conversation and collaboration out of that platform into this platform, and we can only do so much. Then that's yeah, already, does, does like, IT serve the business or does IT control the business? And I think exactly. it's, it's clearly serve. Problem. So, mm -hmm. you know, at some point you've got to look at it and embrace it and, and see what the you only, need to I, I would agree with 100% of that. The only counter argument I do see, I mean, I work with lots of pharmaceuticals, lots of financials, is compliance, infosec, GDPR, data, data discovery. That is a compelling reason to minimize the stack like like you're 100 right it's never going to be 100 percent microsoft right. but if if uh customers are allowed to for, for information discovery say present everything you have on me if you're using dozens of different tools it's very hard to comply like like there's pockets of dropbox there's pockets of box there's pockets of whatsapp there's pockets of the, like suddenly you've got to be like oh how could i possibly practically query all that for a customer name or a customer uh, sensitivity label or whatever that's the counter argument and you know we're what? going to come, come back to that topic on question number three. 
So, or, <laughs> yeah, something else to say, Alan. Yeah, I, I was going to say, since when did you become a governance and compliance expert? I know. Well, I thought I thought I'd wear, I thought I'd wear the other the other shoes, uh, since you guys were both on the uh, pro uh, pro multi uh, vendor. Thing, we'll, come back. well, no, first we talk about the the art of what's possible. And then we clean up. That's that's <laughs> yeah. the model. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, Do so we this, ever get to the clean up? That's the good yeah. question. <laughs> well, the se- the second. Well, I made that comment during the the tweet jam too, and somebody said you know talked about these exact issues, and I, and I said, well, that's I'll use Microsoft terminology as a former employee. You don't talk about problems. You talk about opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> opportunity. I said this is a great opportunity for consultants. So come yeah, on. yeah. When when there's somebody else's opportunity and Microsoft are presenting them, that's when you know they're a problem. Like here's an opportunity for <laughs> consultants who are not Microsoft to solve. <laughs> that's right. Well, so the second question uh, was about um, kind of a broader question, and then we'll get into that the the security compliance. Has the rapid rise of Microsoft Teams altered how you and your customers think about collaboration and communication? Yes, in a short answer. Um, we, I'm certainly seeing a lot more people um, rely on sort of lazy chat, the persistent chat piece. We've gone from an instant messaging world to I want an answer right now to, you know, send me a chat and I'll get back to you later. And everyone's all right with that predominantly. Um, you know, they're using collaboration tools. They're using the, um, the Office Online for co-authoring, Office Pro Plus. You know, getting those um, business processes that used to be edit locally, send it an email to, you know, to DL, and then somebody would make an edit, and then trying to merge all those set, all those merge, all those changes together. Um, that streamlined the business a lot. And um, people aren't looking at their inboxes um, as much as they are, and even people aren't using the telephone as much as they are these days. You know, so it's just as easy to call someone in Teams to send them a chat message. You know, people are. Are starting to to sort of use oh, their fingers rather than their mouth a lot more. Yeah. And that's yeah. what I'm seeing. <laughs> Snappy. <Yeah. laughs> well, that, that's one of the difficult things about it. if you think about from like I come from the SharePoint background. And you, both of you primarily come from the UC side of things, correct? Yeah. Yeah, it, from the SharePoint side of things, and where everything you know, information management, knowledge management conversation has been one of those gaps and from the like the SharePoint world, like we're not capturing this critical, you know, intellectual property. The reality is that, you know, where the real work happens is in between creating and sending and storing documents. It's all of the conversations, the side meetings, none of which are being captured. So the the ability to go in and, and what I think has changed dramatically over the last uh, three, four years is the focus on meetings, on recording and capturing that, and the text-based conversations, uh, both important information assets that were previously lost for a lot of organizations. Yeah, you know, what, what's good about, about Teams is you can co-author a, a doc review, you can make changes on the fly, you can point, you can, you, you can do that in a meeting on the same document, there's no different versions. Um, you can all make edits at the same time. You can have a conversation thread on the on the right. And if anybody's like me, they absolutely hate word comments. You know, so having that in the channel against the document that's that's invaluable. Yeah, I, I feel like Teams has done more for co-authoring and having documents and correct document stores and everything than like we ever could with the individual tools. Like I love SharePoint, but we tried and failed with it two or three times over my ten years at Modality fast pace people who didn't really understand it like people didn't want to check things in and set labels and stuff but but they will use at least a channel and therefore they end up putting their docs in sharepoint therefore there is one version of the document because they don't email it anymore so there was a lot of uh, an inherited benefit that was always in sharepoint but just people use by default now because it's in teams which i think is great but then well, the, the, okay. UI, the ui of teams helps you um, understand that, right? You know, you can click on a customer team. You know, you're probably going to go to the um, the design and deployment channel. You know where the the documents are going to be. Yeah. If you can, if you, you can, can hard code general, your methodology, you can yeah. hard code your methodology into the team, into the project. That's it. I know. But if you just send me to company.sharepoint.com and say get on with it, I'm just going to go. Do you know what? Yeah, that's not. I'm not even going to entertain it. Well, well, that's, I think, for me, in my mind, it's one of the most dramatic changes in 
collaboration, primarily document-based collaboration, and then communication, the meetings and chat and all that, is that, uh, you know, was it was a conscious effort on Microsoft's part to say, look, SharePoint is not a uh, a Swiss Army knife solution that can solve all problems and should be you know cover every workload. It is pr primarily a document management, a portal based solution, and let's let that primary interface be through other places and Teams and Yammer and and even hey, email's not going away, you know. And there are other workloads that are out there and they're just as viable and all that other yeah. stuff. So I I, I think that that separation of 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 what SharePoint is good, but here's the SharePoint things over here. Here's how it coincides with it. It's different than what Teams provides. Yeah, and there's still a reason for a SharePoint document library over a team as well, you know, so. Yeah, and, and you and some people, well, the, the question came up the other day of like, how do you start your day? And for a lot of organizations, like I do day in, day out, I do everything in small business like you, Mark, you know, independent. And so Teams is my primary interface. For most organizations, there's still a portal. There's still that homepage with the news and other things that are going on. They may do their day-to-day, -day, their tasks, their project level activities, all of their conversations and meetings in Teams, but there's still that portal. So. Well, that, that kind of takes us to that third question. So we're, we're in there, we're using Teams more, People are creating teams and channels and adding documents, and they're, everyone is so aware of where their content is going and what happens, the life cycle of that content, correct? People yeah. are yeah, yeah, spot on. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Question three is, what is the state of administration, compliance, and governance within Microsoft Teams? Use Teams, fix it later. <laughs> yeah, that definitely resonates. I think that, that we've been doing some pretty big projects on teams like like tens of thousands of users and previous to this they were wrapped up in infinity conversations about do we allow public or private do we create teams or, or let users create teams how do we do with our sensitivity labeling covid just swept all that aside and it's like bang it out there get the users working and productive from home and we'll work out as we go um, and i think most companies or certainly my feel is most companies are in a use it mode and now we'll work it out. So I think there's a lot of tidying up to do around uh, control, governance, lifecycle management, labels, retention, all that good stuff. Uh, happy to hear otherwise, but my average experience is a lot of that stuff is, yeah, we need to do that, but not actively doing it. Yeah, it becomes when you've got a situation ahead of you that is going to impact your business and potentially shut it down, you go with a low hanging fruit. What's the what are the key objectives I need to produce in terms of technology to enable my business to continue? That's going to be, I need to make a phone call, I need to receive an email, I need to have a meeting. Pretty much those are the three things, um, the course of any business. The rest of it, we'll just figure it out later. But for a lot of companies, that later probably will never come. And the first time that they'll remember to do it is when they get a litigation case and they have to do a query, like Tom said, Case everything and go, oh, hang on a minute, we've not been re retaining this. So there could be, you know, you can't take your eye off your ball. Um, you need to go back and clean up. But also, I also think that IT projects and the way that we deliver them needs to change um, because we, we end up getting, like Tom says, into, you know, two, three, four hours, an entire day conversation about one little thing. Uh, it ends up being an argument. <laughs> And it suddenly becomes the most important thing in the world, but really it's so insignificant that we could have probably just ticked the box and moved on. Um, so we really need, people need a plan of what what Teams is to them. You know, right now it's just a sexy app to them that does everything that they think it they need. Um, they need to figure out what it is they want out of Teams to help Teams use, uh, help their organisation get the best out of Teams. Yeah, I mean, it's so, selfishly, I'd rather it's this way around, though, because, like, it, it's not quite the horse has bolted because most organizations know they're on a platform that have these capabilities. It, 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 <laughs> it means that we don't have to sell it. It's already sold. We just uh, well, well, it. Exactly. <laughs> but, but, like, like, it's a much easier conversation to have with the compliance. Like, well, you're not 
you're not going to disable like like we see crazy stuff like like can we disable all file transfers in teams like well th- that's not how teams work that well that conversation is all largely gone now and now it's like okay we sort of understand what it is now because we're using it and now how can we meet in the middle ground of being compliant to our regs rather than just it's a it's a definite no because it has files in it so we you, can't do that the other problem the storm in the teacup waiting to happen is now that you've given free reign to your end users to create teams to share documents to do what they want bring in guest users to go back in and say right okay so um so sorry that feature that you've been using for the last four or five months we're going to take away from you you know that feature has become line of business so how do you how do you convince the end user that they no longer need it you know and trying to to put an adoption program around that it's going to be a hard sell to turn that into a positive that's uh you know and and it's not like that problem is unique to teams and we these are the same conversations that we had with sharepoint and uh and other platforms so prior to me getting into the 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 microsoft ecosystem so common it issues and it, it's you, you have to balance that uh, of uh of being able to kind of front load any technology deployment be aware of and plan around like every contingency it's impossible to go and do that you have to be working and doing that the other side of it the more locked down a system is the less likely people will use that system you can't do these things without considering how are people actually collaborating? What is the culture of collaboration in our organization? What do people need to get their jobs done? And is IT just standing in the way? Because that's a recipe for you locking down every every uh, you know option you could turn off in Teams, and then your end users are going and using Slack. Yeah, uh, I'm telling you. <laughs> I, I feel like the days have gone on that. Well, we used to go in like like this is five six seven years ago we used to go into meetings and it'd be like well if it don't provide it it's not our problem so if we turn everything off then everything we give people is compliant and if they choose not to use our thing then it's they're not compliant but there, there's a there, i've seen more and more of the reality of like if you're if you are willfully ignoring the fact that whatsapp's being used you're in WhatsApp Teams, you know WhatsApp's being used. Like that's no longer a defense. Like you can't say technically on a bit of paper, it says don't use WhatsApp. If the management team use WhatsApp to talk to anybody in the company, they are implicitly kind of inferring that's a platform of choice. So you, there's no argument of like, we didn't know or we didn't bless it. If managers are using it with anybody subordinate, they are blessing it by virtue of using it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. But then, you know, our the way that we've been brought up in IT is to give the minimum amount of tools and access to in order for the user to do their job or how IT think the user should do their job is probably yeah, because IT thing. definitely knows how the business works, right? Oh, exactly, <laughs> you know, we're saviors of the world, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but I think that's a rec- the recognition is where where a service is is yeah. more apparent in the cloud world because the business has the budget and the power to flip and change things now so i think it's become much more evenly balanced the power power cycle there you know, my point being is perhaps you know we should embrace the technology and say have it all and we'll protect the perimeters so we'll protect the documents leaving our tenant or our network based on whatever rules we put in place with content protection dlps and all that type of stuff we'll let you collaborate inside how you want but we'll audit and we'll do retention policies and make sure that we've got you know, seven years worth of records, and we'll run some adoption, um, you know, frameworks and sessions to make sure that you know how to use use the applications and the systems properly. Um, and we'll just keep an eye on it. If we see something going south that needs people's attention, then we'll address it. But other than that, go and use the, the platform. Yeah. I, I like the analogy. It's we don't need somebody in the pool with every individual instructed them how, okay, now hold your breath and now stroke. What we need is a lifeguard on the outside and see somebody drowning will jump in. Yep. Um, you know, you've got the rules around the perimeter, no running on the uh, around the pool. Um, but otherwise, you know, let people get in there, have fun. Yeah, yeah. I like that analogy. It's good. <laughs> Some of the uh, worst, you know. As yeah, I said to uh, as I said to Erica, my, that's in my comms there, so. as I said to, to uh, Erica Tully, to, she liked an analogy that I uh, used during the session. I said, you know, if I had a dollar for every time somebody used one of my analogies, I'd literally have dozens of dollars. So <laughs> feel free to use that. <laughs> um, so, are there best practices? Question four: Are there best practices 
uh, for aligning Microsoft Teams with SharePoint and other workloads. Like, how do you have that conversation? This is uh, this is a nicer way of saying the you know the, the whole which tool when question, which persists out there. Microsoft hates that that still persists. That's out there, but come on, it, it did, persists. Did because you it's did confusing. you appreciate did you appreciate that none of the Teams people made the joke about you know share what? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, tough. It's a tough conversation. Like, 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 it, like I think I, as I put on my reply, like there are so many options in in Microsoft M365, Office 365, and if you look at Microsoft's kind of uh, job in the world, they're like, we want to provide the productivity tools for everybody, so they have to provide options because not everybody works the same. But there's definitely a job on IT to help coach and 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 inform and again like you said that the, the the lifeguard come analogy like here are your options here's what we think are best for these use cases but we're a service to help this is the idea we're a service to help you choose and 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 coach you along the right way not to force you down a certain road yeah i think that to echo that it comes down to i don't really like the term best practice because to me there isn't a best practice What's a best practice for you is not a best practice for me. And right. Yeah, exactly. So you kind of got to look inside yourself and you got to ask yourself the question, what am I trying to achieve? And if you can answer that question, you can then map your answer to the appropriate technology. If that comes out to be use Teams or use SharePoint or use another program, then and it makes sense to your organization then do it. It doesn't matter what modality you're doing or Symmetry or Mark Vale Consulting Limited is doing. You know, we're doing what works for us, and that's the most important thing. Um, but this, this, uh, so I have this, this point I used to make uh, when I would present and occasionally get a Microsoft salesperson, especially upset at me, where I used to talk in the, the SharePoint world about uh, people saying, "Look, if if your older version of SharePoint is meeting your needs." and you're struggling to find the benefits of moving to the latest version of that, don't move. Sometimes there's nothing wrong with that. You could have a high performing team that functions well, is communicating and, and, and is, uh, is effective on old technology. Now there are benefits to the newer technology. You know, both of you, are, you have this, have had this experience where you go in and, and you're, you're trying to sell people on, well, look, moving to the latest, greatest version brings this added value. And when the benefits of that new outweighs the cost of moving and of change and all of the pain that comes with that, then make that move. But if it doesn't, if the benefits are not there, or if you could do an inter incremental third-party tool, add on to the site or, or you know, construct or configure the solution to meet the needs of those or, or to kind of match that new technology, don't move. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. We, we spend a lot of time, and Tom will resonate with this, we use the word sweat your assets, or the phrase sweat your assets, a lot in telephony, right? So people want to get seven, eight years out of a phone, for instance. Um, but in the Microsoft world, we, we always tend to say, well, every three years, you got to throw it in the bin and start again. You know, we had Link 2010, it was, that was two years old, and Link 2013 came out. Okay, now throw that 2010 deployment away to 2013. Same with 2015, now to Teams and what have you. So we're not used to that in the, in the Microsoft world. I think the point of when you need to move from a technology that's working for you to a, a newer technology is when you can see the death of that product, like in terms of support, security patches, a all that type of thing. If that's going to suppose a security risk to your information, then that's the point where you really not need to consider moving to the next platform, whatever that may be. But until then, you know, use what you've already paid for. Yeah, I, I think it's fascinating now because that's absolutely how the world was for us in enterprise IT. And now we're, people are on the cloud. It's constantly evolving. And actually, you you're taken along for the journey whether you like it or not right now. So it's, the conversation's flipped now. You're getting new features every every month. Um, every, you have a every constant week. job to keep up. Well, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. We, it's weekly. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, that in itself causes a problem, right? Because a company will come to the likes of Medallity and, and whoever I work for, you know, <laughs> myself and say, you know, we want Teams. And we then do a design and a deployment around how Teams is at that moment in time. Now, six months down the line, 
there's a bunch of new features that have either come out and they're not using, or they interfere with what's been deployed, or those features can get deprecated that they depend on. And I'm not seeing anybody really sort of realize that. No, uh, there's not much there's not much pushback at all, which is surprising. Yeah. Like 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 you know, again, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of users at orgs signing up to E5 at the corporate level and then it comes down the chain to the group responsible for x product and they're like oh, it can't do that I'm like, well you bought it and it does like, like like i'm here to help you make the most of it but i can't change how it works and we spend a lot of time in consulting i don't know whether you guys see this too is i'm like i'm not here to sell you the product you, you like microsoft build the product i help you make the most out of it um a, another funny one comes to mind we're working with a sports team and they were like, okay, so who do we tell? We don't, we, we have a change room window during the season. Uh, I won't name the sport. Like no changes can be made. It's vitally important. You know, like this is high money stuff. And I was like, no, and they were like, no, no. Microsoft will know who we are. Don't, don't worry. I'm like, no. <laughs> 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 did, you, did you laugh like that, Tom? Well, I, I was a bit more considerate, but I was just like, you know, like uh, I like, you know, uh, I'm fortunate to work with some huge seat count orgs, and these were not high seat count, but high, you know, high brand. It's just like, yeah, yeah they don't do it for anybody so I, by all means ask maybe you know somebody i don't but it's, it's part of the new world you're signing up to and i think you're right mark people don't necessarily automatically appreciate that yeah that it's that's a big that's a big topic right there um the live tweet jump sorted yeah yeah <laughs> it, so question number five uh in your opinion what are the hits and misses in microsoft's overall collaboration strategy Hits and misses. I think that's a good one. I have to think of this. You, you got one, Tom. Yeah, I was just pulling up my tweet actually because I have a different opinion depending on when you ask me. Like, like the, the 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 number one hit for me, just a high level, is the mobile experience. Like, like Skype and generally Microsoft didn't really nail mobile in the past. Like the the iOS Android experience for Teams is pretty second to none. I think I would I would even go as far as to say the mobile team are ahead of the desktop team in terms of features, experience, like that they really know it. That's so important in, in this day and age. Across um, multiple workloads. Yeah, they've done a great job. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And embracing iOS and Android, like fully footed, not just Teams, but the whole of Microsoft. Like this is a re the new reality. Like like we're not winning on mobile. We'd have to go where the users are. So Mac, you know, Mac clients. Um, so that that's a real big hit for me. I think the 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 agility of the Teams team, like building on a cloud way, microservices changing fast. It's a blessing and a curse with all these feature changes and stuff. But net net, there is zero chance Microsoft would have been competitive in this last six months around the world changing if it was Skype servers running in Office 365 or on-prem. Like the the cloud providers would have just absolutely smashed it. So for me, what's happened around the world has kind of massively uh, vindicated the fact they said, stop, we need a reset, we need to build cloud first. Um, yeah, any other hits before we go to misses, guys? I had a really good one <laughs> and then carried on talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think the biggest hit for, for Teams is they've made companies use Office 365 for its intended purpose. So before Teams, people, there were a lot of pe people, even big SIs, who saw Office 365 as exchange migrations. You know, uh, it's just like exchange online, that's Office 365. It's not. It was, And Teams is the app that makes everybody use all the tools of Office 365, how they should have been used but then unifies it into... That, into that is a fantastic one, actually. You're right, because there was so much pressure to buckle and do a UC client. Like, like we just want meetings. Just give me... They, they've, they've stayed really firm on, no, we're a collab stack play and really, you know, pushed hard against the market, certain customers saying, I just want to go from Skype to Teams to UC. And that, again, has borne out to be a good strategy, I think. And I'll just add on to it, because that's kind of a, a you know, a, 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 a different take on my point earlier of SharePoint is the focus on portals, everything else that, that you know, Microsoft Teams as that hub for teamwork was the right message to to drive that. They've been consistent. Uh, so, yeah. I, I should just rename 365 to Teams 365. And there you go. 
I think that's yeah. what I, we're probably going to be there in 18 to 24 months. So, yeah. <laughs> should tweet that out let's see if uh if like Lori or, or caruana slip up and be like oh yeah that's the plan oh. uh, yeah 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 <laughs> all right so uh question six uh where oh, we are we you any, we didn't do any misses we just did right, the nice stuff. that's right that's right oh, oh, there's a miss some, right there miss. Nice okay yes. <laughs> we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we weren't a little critical right the misses yeah go on you got christian what have you got well, I think the number one response from everybody on there is the the uh, tenant switching and not having thought through. And and let me just say that uh, early on, uh, that feedback when when teams launched that day one, that was an issue that there were a number of us that that brought up. And as MVPs and regional directors kept bringing this to the, trying to bring this to the attention of the the teams of the engineering team, the product team. And they kind of pushed back and said, well, it's not our primary scenario. I said, the people that use this product the most and that are most vocal and that are selling this to customers are telling you this is a major problem. And uh, uh, so you need to think about this. Who, who are the, the movers and shakers, the people pushing the product? Um, if they're telling you this is a major uh, uh, issue, you need to prioritize this higher so i know that yeah. they're working on it and it's it's gotten the, the experience has gotten better and the mobile experience for moving between tenants has greatly improved in fact improved quicker than the browser or the desktop yeah group. again the, the mobile team doing a great job there you're right the tenant switching on mobile is, is really snappy well the, the the mobile app you can be signed into multiple accounts get notifications from lots of different tenants on one app so yeah there must be something with like iOS and Android that Windows 10 can't do. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe Microsoft's just waiting for us to go completely mobile and they'll be like, see, problem solved. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll release a, a Surface phone that'll be like 25 inches screen, like, you know, <laughs> carry that in your pocket, on your hip, on your, like a pager. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I think I'd agree with that. that that's the biggest miss, the tenant switching. Um, but I understand why it's that way. Um, and that's just because of the way. Office 365 is built with your AD authentication. That's the main reason. Yeah, you, uh, you can both technically understand something and not like it. That's definitely where I see it. Like there's there's obvious reasons why they're doing it that way. The security model, the tenant model, a lot of benefits we gain on the back end, but it is a user experience challenge for sure. Yeah. I mean there are there are a few nuances like with meeting experiences. If you're a guest in a tenant and you're trying to invite them into a t into a meeting using ad participants, that doesn't that's not cool right now. Yeah. No. Well, and that's that's my other biggest issue, and it's it it, it it it's really just come up more because of the quarantine, and and we've tried to you know focus so much on you know what we're doing. I'm, I would love to be able to run all of the community activities, all of the online things that I'm doing using Teams, and we've been beaten up like we do uh, weekly office hours, and we were. Uh, uh, live streaming to social channels. You cannot live stream to social channels straight from Teams. You've got to use a bunch of different components. Well, we were using Zoom. And for webinars, I use Zoom. And there's a lot of other webinar functionality that does not exist within Teams of why I'm a paid Zoom user for webinars. Um, and I, I find myself again and again reminding people, well, Teams is an enterprise application, an enterprise solution, and it works beautifully for those scenarios where the vast majority of people that you're working with, collaborating, meeting with are within your organization. And then you bring in some some out, outside folks, some yeah. guest users. But for a webinar, like they're, everybody's external. And then I want to have things like Q&A and, uh, uh, and a chat and polling and I don't know. I'd like to know who joined my webinar, who they were, and and data around that experience. But I mean, on, on that point, though, yeah. I, it's going back to what we said before: is that Teams was a, is a collab play. It's all about making your business work together. Right. Zoom is just a VC app that somebody just spun up some servers, made made it easy, right. easy download. Right. Yeah. You know, you can use it for VC. Now, all of a sudden, people now have started to compare two different products, and it's like apples and pears. 
Right. You know, we want to try and get the apple to look like the pear and have the same features as the pear, but still be an apple. Yep. You know, it, so. you're, you're, exactly. It's a, yeah. We would use the uh, apples versus oranges, but pears, the <laughs> fruit, apples <laughs> versus kumquats, it all works. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, you're exactly right. It's uh, that's why I said that it's it's kind of accelerated and made uh, uh, you know surfaced a lot of those kinds of you know issues or if you even call it an issue. I mean, it, it, you know, teams look. There's some we can talk about performance issues with teams live events and, and meetings and video quality and things that they did because they saw, I don't even know what the number is, like 750% growth over the last quarter. I mean, just crazy numbers. And so they had to throttle some features like video quality took a hit just to make sure that servers were performing and we could still have meetings and, and adjustments will be made. We'll get back to our 4K quality in real time while we're gaming on the same system. <laughs> That's what multiple browsers are for, people. Work here, game here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's a, you know, so it, it's it's difficult to compare those things, but at the same time is I need to have reliable, high quality webinar uh, video content and I'm just I'm not able yet to do today what I can do on other platforms. Yeah, and no, that's the maturity of the conversation you said about different tools for different use cases. Like Teams never was never built for podcast webinar use case. That they're, they're definitely, if you look at the roadmap, they're like starting to invest in some of those features because of the competitive threat of Zoom. Um, but exactly to your point, like like it's funny people try and I don't know if you, again if you guys get this, people will try and goad you into like a a religious war of like teams can't do this, teams can't do that. I'd be like, no, nope, can't. Right. Like right. seven yeah. quid or whatever. If you want to use Zoom, like I'm not, I'm not here to convert you. I'm just right. here to make the yeah. most of what you. By the way, your org's already paid for this, so <laughs> if you want to use it. Um, but yeah, it's it, like like that. It's a mature conversation about right use case. Um, I, I think it'll be interesting to see over the, you know this market moves fast how well Microsoft do it in absorbing more and more of those features. Um, and does that dilute the experience because there are too many options or does it suit everybody? It's a real uh, tightrope. Here's a, here's a question that's like off piece, but what do you reckon the end goal is for teams? What's the end play? Where do you see it? I don't think there is a defined end goal other than do what people need to be productive. So I don't think there is like a some book in Microsoft or some Word document or something that or PowerPoint that has the plan <laughs> that in five years it'll be this. I think it's more like a soap opera. They're, they're writing. Yeah, exactly. they go, uh, yes. They'll look at well, people really yeah. like that character what, Tom. The, let's the, really yeah, build him up and let's kill off the Mark. viewership. Watch the viewership. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you see that in some of the changes of direction that have been made. You know, like it's a, it's a, it's an agile cloud platform. So I, yeah, I, I'll, the only thing I will say is obviously Microsoft appreciate to your point earlier. It's dragging people into the Office 365 stack. I think that whatever shape or form it evolves to, it's going to be about getting people into the stack play. Yeah, and then they've got your graph and they know everything about you. Right. Yep. Yeah, that's right. I just thought just you just have to be concerned if they pick up that tagline, if they decide to do some variant of um, don't be evil. <laughs> when they say that, you know that they've gone into the dark <laughs> side and that that's that's a clear sign. Well, uh, so let's jump on. So, so what number six? Where are you and your customers making investments in Microsoft Teams, such as automation, adoptions, etc., and why? Um, I'm seeing my customers now really embrace telephony. A lot of the a lot of the companies that I've worked with the last couple of years have really been focusing on trying to get teams into the organization just on a chat and meetings first type experience. And it's like, right, okay, well, we're going to wait till till FME gets a bit more mature. And we're seeing the, you know, the features of diet routing, the features of the team's telephony um, stack, you know, really maturing now. And people are starting to take it seriously. Um, we're on a 15, 16,000 seat direct routing migration to from Skype um, into Teams right now. Um, and they love it. They can't wait to get, you know, that feature into Teams. They're still... That challenge around collaboration, no one really knows how it should work. It would be great if we could just turn that off because then we can get people into Teams quickly with all the core workloads and then they can slowly uh, or turn collab on at a pace that's um, manageable for them, in, in my opinion. 
Yeah, so that's, that's a tough one, that turn collab off thing, because I think Microsoft are prepared to wait out the telephony market to keep the collab. Like if they win telephony and lose collab, they've lost because telephony goes mobile eventually or whatever whatever shape or form that is on an infinite scale. Um, but I would, I would echo what you're saying, actually, in terms of what we're seeing in the market. Like telephony is definitely on the up because, again, everybody agile working, remote working, whatever you want to call it, suddenly all those IP phones are gathering dust in offices and they need a soft phone. So that's that's definitely a thing. Um, unfortunately, user adoption, adoption change management has taken a big hit. Um, I think you said this, Christian, in the tweets, actually, whenever budgets get strained, that's one of the first things to go. Um, yeah. But also people have to to use it largely again at the moment because their corpse have jumped to it so i don't need to pay somebody to coach and cajole my users into doing it if they don't do it we can't get working um i'm not i'm not seeing the level of investment i would like to see in infosec governance security labeling retention all that kind of stuff that's what i'd like to see uh it's it's not coming mass market yet but i think that needs to well, i don't think that the messaging is that strong around a lot of that capability too a lot of like customers just kind of uh, you know they do go to the defaults you know and the, yeah the, we well, they think they they think they bought it i was in a conversation right. where i was like we're e5 so we're compliant i'm like no that's not how compliance works yeah <laughs> right well, it, it, it's just nature of human humanity right we don't like difficult conversations and you know, if it's something it, that it, statement it, makes me very un uh, uncomfortable, Mark. So, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Mark. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, you're, you're, you're spot on. I mean, especially when you start talking about uh, when you're uh, looking at uh, usage patterns and how people are using the platform. Uh, it, it's it's amazing how quick with an adoption of a technology how passionate people get, how quickly they get passionate about and defensive about their use of that technology. Yeah, no, and the, what I'm seeing with the customer right now in terms of, you know, what's hot and what's not, you know, they're looking for teams to fix some internal processes. And that can be like teams provisioning, that could be related governance, it could be collecting, how do we collect surveys and, um, you know, post to a team and all that type of stuff. And it's like, well, you can use forms, your license for it. You can use Power BI. And they go, oh, no, no, no. I want to I want to buy a tool that just does that for me. And I'm like, well, you've already bought it. You just need to know how to use it. And it's like, oh, no, no, it's too, it's too hard. So I think there's a lot from, from a project level. There's still that resistance and nervousness towards adopting the entire stack and, you know, and really going for it as an organization. Um, but conversely, when you roll teams out to a user and you turn on things like Power Automate um, forms and they suddenly realize they can do it on their own, it becomes... Yeah, the people in the business, the, the, the people that used to be the um, the VB guy or girl in Excel that ran the whole business on Excel, they're popping up again. They're like, oh, Power Apps, boom, boom, boom. Here's my business process. Yeah. Like, hi, IT, I've built this whole thing. Like, it's crazy. I think yeah. that that is, we're just at the beginning of that curve. It's pretty interesting. You, you know, it is interesting that they put so much emphasis around the marketing of when teams launched around bots and connectors and, and a lot of that kind of automation. And yes, it was still early. The Power Platform wasn't named the Power Platform and, you know, rebranding and Microsoft Flow and Power Automate and all those kinds of things. But we're now seeing uh, in the community that the user groups around the power platform are, are the, some of the fastest growing that we've ever seen. It's just exploding. And whether you call it the uh, citizen development you know, movement or some people referring to now the movement as the maker movement within software, um, but it's exactly that point is once people realize that not only are the tools out there, but they're not as difficult to use as you perceive them to be. And, and any business user can get in there and leverage existing templates and tools that are out there modified to meet their needs or create things from scratch. That, you, know, you hear again and again, like within a couple hours, I was able to go in and build this out and we're using it. It's fantastic. And you hear that story over and over again. Yeah, drag and drop's a thing. It used to be like PowerShell and you know, learning code. Now it's just back to GUI and, and a mouse click. That's right. Well, the last question of the of the tweet jam was if you could ask for anything, what would be your top three feature requests from Microsoft Teams? 
Um, my first one would be a bit more control, admin control over notifications, being able to sort of set a default of what we think or what the organization thinks is important notification to po post onto people's screens. That would be you know, a good thing because um, right now some of the some of the white glove services that you could do in Skype uh, put onto the end user and it'd be nice to be able to control, not, wouldn't say control that, but to help uh, an end user through an admin control to set a default, a profile, a client profile, if you want to call it, um, you know, that gives them a better head start because, you know, what we don't want to see is people to launch teams and then all of a sudden they get bombarded with a thousand notifications. Um, yeah, that's so a good one. That'd be my, my first one. What's your first one, Tom? Yeah, my first one is um, a UI tweak that I have had many debates with many people at Microsoft. Uh, reply? Hopefully you're, still, hopefully you're still friends. Yeah, replies versus new threads. Like, mm -hmm. it kills me. Every deployment I'm engaged in, the first indent. thing that happens is... Just indent it. Come yeah, on. It, it, it feels like a very solvable problem to me, and I'm sure it's yeah. more complicated than I give credit for, but um, like changing the UI so that accidental new threads don't happen, I think that would in, improve engagement in channels um, so much. So I, I'm flying the flag for that changing in the UI for sure. There's, there's a couple of people that commented in the discussion today about it's like, you know, how does it work in Yammer? Why can't some of that learning come over into Teams? Because I think they do a better job at that. Yeah, I mean, going on, my number two would have been similar to, to yours, Tom, but I was going to ask for multi-threaded conversations. So that if you start a conversation, Christian might reply to that conversation and then three others, and then I might come in and I want to reply to, to Tom's first question or to Christian's question. I want that thread to go underneath that one so that you know oh, what that's interesting. I'm replying to. Yeah, I don't think it yeah. needs to be any any deeper than you know two levels. So like your main conversation reply and then another thread under the reply. I think that's enough. Even yeah. one less than that, the quote reply we have on mobile, like having yeah. that on desktop would also help that scenario where I want to yeah. reply to a message three up. That's it. But then you know then you've got to scroll through. A yeah, then it. Yeah. Ton of um, ton of replies yeah. to, get to ping the conversation together. So um, we have it on social platforms like Facebook. It's not hard to do. Right. You know, it's probably a few extra columns in a database table somewhere. You know, <laughs> that's how it works. I love it when we're on this side of the fence. But like, surely you just, you know, database it's stuff. Just a, <laughs> that's it. It's just like a drop. Power yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, we're just we're just tweaking people. Come on, something. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, you know, and I made the comment and I realized that uh, this is more complex than what we've discussed so far, but. I'd love an easy button for archiving a team. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and look, and I realize that there's a lot. Uh, so I see this question every once in a while. It was, uh, again, in the early days of Teams, was asked frequently, like, well, how do I, um, you know, if I delete a team? It's like, well, you don't want to delete a team. Here's why. There's a lot of downstream impact to that. Disconnecting users, the content that exists, all the other conversations, the history, all that kind of stuff. It's like, but I think there is a valid request for wanting to archive in one place. And, and 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 obviously you have assets that are there physically, the presentation layer in Teams. There's a lot of things that live in Exchange, a lot of things that live within uh, groups and within SharePoint. It's all those different places. But the, the ability to go and say, it's like, well, we are now, we're archiving it and it would auto disconnect all the end users except for the admin back up via Azure and wherever those things live, all of those other assets, it rolls all those things up. People want that. That sounds awesome. Yeah, there's definitely a nervousness to like at the end of the lifecycle management of a team to like get rid of it, archive, delete, whatever, because of like, well, how do I, as the business user, how do I get it back? And can IT get all of it back? And where does it, where do I reference it if I need to? Is it, it, that's a really good one, actually. Yeah, my third one would be the ability to, customize my desktop space with Teams. So right now we've got the left-hand app bar. I want to be able to dock conversations maybe on the right or on the bottom and be able to have, you know, to use the real estate that Teams takes up more effectively. Oh, that's interesting. Me. You really want Teams to be Windows, don't you? Yeah. 
Well, right now, you know, I, we've got pop-out chat, which is great. You know, it'd be good to have them docked into, you know, into the the, um, the app so that, you know, I can see, you know, like we've got the Teams meeting now where you've got one of us has a video tile at the bottom. It'd be good to have conversations there that just flash up when they reply and I could be working. I could be in a meeting now. I could be on a document yeah. and just click to respond. Nicely. And that, that's that's part of the problem is like, I was excited to, about the, uh, you know, the pop-out chat and have that in the side doesn't work it shuts down if you switch a tenant there's no way to monitor a conversation across tenants except to have multiple tabs and windows open and you know and so uh, that's something so i had suggested back at the team's airlift um an idea i said i'm a i use hootsuite I would love to have a hootsuite type interface that the api is allowed so i could actually follow conversations from channels and I select which channel conversations and it drops it into this column view where it's real time going by and I can monitor those. And if I click on one, it opens up that conversation in the Teams uh, application. Like I would love that capability. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's like a proper power user play. Like you, your 65 inch screen with like 20 uh, conversations. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's that'd be fantastic. <laughs> People well, in, in Excel screens. Uh, well, what I love is that when I asked that question at the air, at the team's airlift, and that was for those that know the airlift, it was almost entirely it was MVPs and uh, some other invited partners with the Microsoft product team going in depth. A lot of NDA discussions happen around there, but this was my idea, so I can share this. And there was a pause in the comments. And the guy presenting the product team members said, that, that's a really good idea for a product. Like, yeah, yeah. not a coder. <laughs> hey, it's a big day for you two tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah. Big five day tomorrow. Yeah. Well, the, the uh, so we're just to wrap things up. So we have, uh, so I don't know if any other parting you know, takeaways from the tweet jam, anything else that stood out to either of you? Uh, I guess the last thing for me is it's nice to see Microsoft engage in these things. Like it shows a real good level of community feedback and engagement. Like even when you ask questions of like what's good about Teams, what's bad about Teams, I don't see many vendors actively engaging in those conversations. Like they'd rather just stick their fingers in their ears. But you see lots from Microsoft are going, yep, we hear you. We're thinking about it. We're on it. We at least acknowledge it's a problem. Like, like I, I really appreciate that. And seeing them like um, Commsverse, having Microsoft speak there directly, other community events, they're speaking directly. They're engaging in online events, left, right and center. I think that's really great. Yeah, if anybody thinks that Microsoft is not listening, uh, they, they are definitely listening. I, I promise you at least a dozen product team members were lurking uh, throughout the tweet jam and listening in and taking yeah. notes. And of course, Lori, who's presenting at Commsverse and um, you know one of the keynotes was there and active. And and when that question about uh, you know what are your f feature requests, and she even responded, it's like I'm, I'm listening, I'm taking notes, I'm here. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's it is great. Yeah. Ultimately, if you give the user what they want, they're going to keep you. If you don't give the user what they want, and you don't listen to them, they're going to go somewhere else. So yeah. everyone's got to listen if they want. If they want their product to survive, especially in this hyper um, competitive market, they need to listen to their users and take feedback constructively. Yes, we can all be a bit abrasive sometimes because that's frustrations, you know, of not being able to do something. Um, but to see through that and to see what the the ask really is, and then spit that out. Um, yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't bother to feedback if you didn't care, and that's that, no, that's no, nice. That's, that's mostly it. acknowledged. Um, I also think that you know the eagerness to try and please. It can also lead to a negative, and we see that with announcements at different events like Ignite and what have you, where they're promising a feature, and it's like going to be delivered in Q4 next year, and it's like, right, okay, it's it's a year off. It's probably not even on the death bench yet. We just sort of dreamt it up before the before the the, the session. Scandalous, Mark. Maybe Scandalous. You you're suggesting things that aren't fully <laughs> baked are sometimes announced. I can't believe that. I, I did it with Converse, mate. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I had a, a, I think a great feature request would be actually a, a logged in experience to the Microsoft roadmap, where it would actually it would give me the roadmap through the lens of my tenant. That would be amazing. And, yeah, it's so hard for user adoption to say yeah. like some people have got it, some people haven't, and it, that those features roll out 
like as a giant global service. So even people within your tenant f- features roll at different times sometimes. Yeah, good good one. Yeah, it'd be great to be able to go in and look at the, from the admin experience and see. I, I'm reading through. In fact, yesterday I was reading through the latest announcements. The uh, you know of what's what's coming and and, uh, and and it'd be awesome just to see like a little color indicator, like green. Okay, it's on my tenant. You know. But, you know, let, let, let's let's spin it. Everybody likes a surprise, right? So surprise, you got a new feature. <laughs> uh, I do think that they need to be a bit, bit more sort of um, open with delivery timelines so that you know if a feature is on track roughly when it's going to drop and not just quarters. You know, even to the month would be better than quarters so you can plan for it um, and have the option to, you know, to defer that feature or have an option to turn that feature off by default as it's deployed into your tenant so that you can manage that through, that would be useful. So then that, that doesn't stop Microsoft having a billion tenants all with different configs. They can yeah. still deploy that same standard config to all those tenants, but then give the use the customer the control of when to leverage that feature, um, especially if it's optional. If it's mandatory, and then they've got no choice. But if it's an optional feature, then just well, turn it off. But, but you do have that somewhat. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. It kind of goes back, Tom, to what you were saying earlier about it's like, you know, it, it's the, the difference between the waterfall method and this evergreen software. Um, but there is the ability to go in and select, I want my organization to be on a fast or slower ring. So I want to be at the front end of a new feature deployment or at the the tail end of that. It's really difficult to do that on a feature by feature basis with where there could be codependencies of features and capabilities. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the Q, the infinity QA matrix of every feature having an on and off button. So we do some software dev, so I can see both sides of this argument. Absolutely, from an enterprise point of view, I want a, a button for every single feature. And then I'm like, oh, the nightmare of the development and QA of that. I have to test every test case with every feature toggled in every direction. So it's a, it's a balancing act, and we'll see, we'll see where it goes. Customers will push one way or the other. I, I wouldn't like to be a, a Microsoft team system admin in Microsoft because it'd just be... Oh, it frightened me. <laughs> Having to, re- <laughs> to deploy something and take a region down potentially. Oh no, that's somebody else's job. <laughs> yeah. I'm, well, sure well, of, I'm sure there are a lot of eyes on it, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> well, gentlemen, really appreciate your time today. Thanks again for participating in the Tweet Jam, and uh, I'm go check out and I'll share the, the stats and everything as well as part of the blog post here. And uh, for those that uh, still have not done so. Please go and register for the free online uh, conference, the Commsverse event happening July 6th through 9th. And any final plug there, Mark? Uh, no final plug. We plugged it enough now. <laughs> if, if you like Teams, uh, then be yeah. there. don't like Teams, it's not for you. Join a Zoom conference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, gentlemen, and both. And have a great rest of your week. And we'll uh, we'll see you online in the in the pre-event events activities going on this week, uh, but go check out uh, commsverse.com and uh, register today. Well, thanks, Thanks, Jim. Thanks a lot.